Good afternoon and welcome to the Hamilton Wealth Partners Thought Leader webinar. Um, and this afternoon, we're very privileged to have with us Mark Burgess. A special welcome as well to the clients of Maxima Private who are attending um, and Jackie Clark and her colleagues as well. This originally was actually going to be in person in Sydney. Um, we were going to be doing this with Maxima, so but we're really pleased we're able to do it as a webinar. Um, I'm just going to start though with a general advice warning as we usually do. So the information contained in this webinar has been provided as general advice only. The contents that have been prepared without taking into account any objectives, financial situation or needs. You should, before you make any decision regarding any information strategies or products mentioned in the webinar, consult your advisor to, cons to consider whether it is appropriate having regard to these objectives, financial situations and needs. So as I just mentioned, and you can see we're, we're very, very lucky to have with us again, uh, Mark Burgess. He was the former CEO of the Future Fund, Australia's Sovereign Wealth Fund. He's worked internationally, including in London-based Executive Vice President and CEO of Credit Suisse Asset Management and Global CIO of Equities and Multi-Assets. Other Global CIO roles for American Express, Express Colonial First State and Bankers Trust. He's also currently the Chairman of the Advisory Board for Jamison Cook Bonds. Chairman Asia for OMFIF, a global think tank focused on central banking and financial markets. Board member of a large family office to IP Group, advisor to IP Group, a leading investor in early stage academic research. The enterprise professor at the University of Melbourne and also the chairman of Melbourne Girls Grammar School. He's the governor of Cerebral Palsy Foundation and chairman of the DB Foundation, which supports state school students who reach tertiary education and finally, the Chairman of the Investment Committee and Director of HESTA. So very welcome, Mark. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this again today. Thanks, Will. I'm going to hand over to you, Mark, just to talk uh, for 15, 20 minutes, and then I'm going to open up with some questions. Again, for those in the audience, there is the Q&A button at the bottom. Please feel free to put some questions in there. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Will, and thanks very much for attending and uh, being part of the conversation. I guess I'd also just congratulate everybody on presumably um, everyone's had a terrific year from an investment performance recovery perspective. Um, and in fact, you know, that foundation of a really strong year is probably something we need to reflect on uh, and really ask ourselves how that happened um, because clearly uh, what's occurred up until now um, is a foundation on which we have to then manage looking forward. Uh, one of the things I've noticed over the years is that you know, sometimes boards, particularly of institutions, uh, tend to relax after a really strong year, which is fair enough, we should enjoy it. Um, but as things move forward, uh, it's clearly the case that perhaps things are getting more expensive. And, uh, and this, is prob this is where we find ourselves at the moment. I thought I'd just quickly touch on my interpretation of what's occurred the last 12 months, what we're dealing with at the moment, and just a couple of comments on the secular outlook. Um, I think if we take one lesson away though from the last period, a uh, good strategy, strategy around the way you invest, uh, is very important. And so today we'll talk about macro events and macro drivers, uh, but I am a fundamental believer that's a, only one element of what goes into investing. And there's multiple elements that really go to constructing portfolios, the way you approach risk, the way you approach, for example, diversification. And if you'd stuck to clear strategies last year, uh, it would have got you through, um, through the period and you would have captured the gains. There's no doubt, and I fell into this in the early part, I was concerned about the volatility. In fact, I've noticed that uh, probably the older you were, the more experienced you were, perhaps a little more cautious you were, at least initially. Um, but we could see through the year that there was a sudden rush. And I just want to talk about that first. So why have we had this very strong rally? And it's really th three fortuitous factors. Uh, first of all, central banks, um, and I see this through OMFIC, which is a think tank for central banks, sovereign funds and institutions. So we get together and talk with central banks on about 150 meetings a year, um, you could see that they had a game plan in place. They'd seen the financial crisis. So if any way we, we were lucky that they could immediately implement it, they knew exactly what to do. This had been pre-planned. They'd also, central banks had also been doing something in the year before, uh, which I commented on, but they had been preparing um, the world really for the notion that they didn't have a lot of fire, firepower necessarily. They had been talking about the need for fiscal policy should there be another cyclical downturn at any point. In fact, Phil Lowe here in Australia, I thought in some ways was brave talking about the need for more fiscal, even when it wasn't necessary at that point. But central bankers at Jackson Hole in 2019 were preparing the world for fiscal 
I think that helped because I think what we saw through last year, particularly after March, April, May and June, when the markets then really took off, uh, was, was very strong fiscal response. And it was the fiscal response that gave the extra kicker to financial markets. Um, the second element that, that supported markets last year was that institutional investors themselves had experienced 2008. They knew that 35 40% corrections was more an opportunity than a chance to get out. And while uh, institutions here in Australia had to deal with some other things, such as withdrawal from super, generally speaking, around the world, institutions were ready to engage. In fact, I saw this in February when I visited a distressed, uh, distressed debt manager. At that stage, COVID wasn't even being talked about in the US, um, but I asked him about the next down cycle, what were they planning? They had already had very large pre-commitments for any cyclical downturn. And that's the lesson from 2008 is, is prepare. So institutions, once we saw policy come into play, were very quick to come behind that. Private equity had a very large pool of uninvested capital that was already pre-committed. Um, and, then, and then of course we saw the movement up. Perhaps the group that surprised us in the last 12 months has been the role of retail investors around the world. And I think again, this is people having seen 08 and feeling they've missed out, particularly young people ironically seem to have been very uh, quick on the gun to, to get back involved in, in risk. The third element is the foundation on which this occurred. Um, two factors there, I think the market could smell the prospect of at least a vaccine or some strategy around it. That was important, but really the other issue was that technology and technology stocks, and particularly those large caps in the US, were net beneficiaries, and that became fairly obvious, and they helped lead the process of the last 12 months. Another factor, though, that came has come into play, which is really a 35 or 40 year aspect, has been this continuous downward move in real interest rates. Um, we should not underestimate it, and I think when I was asked about this last year, um, this has set up a series of habits, and what we saw was really a turbo boost of that, where we saw another significant drop down in, in real interest rates, and that's where we stand today. And really this notion of lower for longer, institutions that believe that rates were not going to back up much uh, and were positioned for risk could uh, take advantage of it. And we have this dilemma today where the alternatives for investing are very, very slim. In fact, real rates are low, and perhaps we'll talk about that uh, later on. In terms of the next stage of the cycle, though, the market's trying to come to grips with what normal looks like and how normalization occurs. And I'll just make a couple of quick observations there. First of all, at the forum I'm involved with, my sense is that central banks do not want to make a mistake. They learned in the late 2018 in the US uh, that they tightened too early. Their signaling was poor, it caused volatility. And so they've already made it fairly obvious. Uh, Phil Lowe spoke earlier this, uh, this week. Uh, it's pretty obvious that they're going to be cautious in the way they tighten, when they tighten, the way they treat monetary policy, unless something significant happens. But I still think they're going to ease their way through this. Um, the second group that we need to ask ourselves about is, uh, is fiscal policy. And I think that's less clear. And I think the markets are not really factoring it in. You will have seen in the last few days that the UK government, for example, has begun to raise taxes. But what is the inherent uh, response eventually of fiscal policy here? And midterms in, mid in the US could be very important. So for example, if the Republicans get both the lower and upper house, they may be tempted to use the playbook they used against Obama, which is fiscal tightening is a good idea, makes the president wear the responsibility for that, even though they're creating it, and that slows the economy up. So we've certainly got a fiscal cliff facing us. We don't know what the scale of that will be. All the markets will be slightly different, but that uh, could cause volatility. Against that, there is pent-up demand. There, there are excessive savings. It has been a, an environment where there is the private sector is likely to continue to ratchet higher, um, and so that may offset the fiscal contraction. But the fiscal contraction needs to be uh, monitored fairly closely. But as we sit here today, markets are not cheap, and we've had another factor, which is that we've had almost an everything rally. In other words, everything has gone up. Whenever any, everything goes up, we tend not to sort of take much notice of it. But what that's also saying is that it's been a highly correlated rally. And correlation, of course, is something we try to think about when we construct portfolios, because we try to develop portfolios that, that have a mix and match. We don't notice it when everything goes up. We don't sit back and say, gee, that wasn't so good. But we do notice it when everything goes down together. Um, but when everything's gone up, you have to think about, well, why are assets behaving the way they are? And certainly the smartest investors out there are thinking about the way to construct a portfolio looking forward. 
and particularly what does defensive look like in a portfolio uh, given the rally that we've had in so many asset classes. In terms of the medium term outlook, um, I think markets are also beginning to try and factor these in and think them through. Um, clearly the role of China uh, is important and it's moving to its own drum at the moment, um, but I think that's significant. Um, the other factor the markets have to think about is real rates. Real rates have been enormously favorable, as I mentioned, um, and will they now trade sideways? Will they back up slightly over time? But I would guess, and I've been wrong on this, frankly, because of these extra surgeries in the last 12 months, but I would guess that rates are in for a sideways movement. And that may raise the question for asset classes that have had 35 years of this tailwind. And I just note, for example, in areas like private equity today, leverage is at its, at its widest amounts that we've seen. Uh, and that's indicative of a very long-term trend. I don't want to pick on private equity per se, but all of those unlisted asset classes that institutions are pouring money into today have also been levering into the very benefit of falling real rates. And if there's any change in that trend, they need to think that through in the next phase. Uh, my view is that in the next period, in the next five to 10 years, we just simply won't have the support of falling real rates in long duration assets. And the quality of the asset and the way you pick assets and the way active managers um, invest in the actual asset itself, the assets performance will drive performance, not just falling rates, re-rating everything. And, and I think that's something we need to prepare for. Uh, other trends we need to look at, demographics is gonna come into play again. Uh, I think it's absolutely uh, vital. It's gonna slow growth um, and it's gonna to start to have an impact. I still continue to personally monitor those demographic winners, the Indias, Indonesias, Philippines, and others. Can we find ways to make money there? And then also cautiously think through the demographic profile effects uh, in some of the, uh, in, in the developed markets, but in other parts of Asia, we're about to see a demographic cliff of great importance, say in South Korea and other markets, Japan, of course. Um, if we look at technology, uh, technology was also a key factor. And I think we should just pause and say how great tech's been for our portfolio in reality. Um, you didn't have to chase speculative stocks per se to capture the tech return. And there's been two parts of that. One, you essentially had to be overweight US equities and capture the five majors, which are very strong and well-structured companies. Um, but you also had to think about some of the areas such as you know, retail property and playing the short side. This issue of finding the winners and avoiding the losers is obviously going to be a theme to play out in the next period. Um, the, the other issue about tech, of course, is that we've had the benefits of the technology of vaccines. Um, and I'm sure everyone's aware, but it really is remarkable how that's come into play. Uh, for technology investing, again, you would be familiar with this, the valuations are somewhat hair raising, somewhat uh, significant in terms of their multiples and navigating through the valuations and navigating through the structure of your tech portfolio, again, will be an important element. Um, they really have been terrific returns though. And I think it's also shows the power of well-structured VC investment, uh, lots of bets, the way you do your bet sizing, for example, throughout the portfolio. Um, and I think that uh, that'll be a theme clearly that we'll be playing towards. I think the central banks don't discuss this too much, but low rates in effect has been the most favorable thing uh, that you can imagine for technology um, because it's encouraged essentially almost free capital in the sector. And in some ways that's a challenge because it means that capital, i.e. technology, uh, is, a is a beneficiary relative to labor. And we could see some real productivity improvements here uh, through the use of technology in a whole range of sectors, particularly in areas like finance, um, but the whole crop right across the sector technology could have a surge of productivity here. But that of course could cause pressure on the labor market, which is something that is being causing political stress, but also stress for societies as wage rates re refusing to respond to the upside. So there are many themes to talk through and perhaps I won't go through all of them. Uh, and just a couple of other quick ones though, to touch on, um, you know, uh, things like uh, the role of ESG and climate change. Uh, in my career, I've not seen such a strong shift in emphasis, particularly by institutional investors, but by retail as well. I think there is a very strong uh, sense that we all want to do good impact investing, that environmental, social and governance is the right way to run businesses. But what that's doing is it's shifting capital quickly in that area. And therefore, you'll need to select your investments quite carefully because it's a very competitive field. Um, I'm a supporter of it. But I think we need to think through and be just be you know focused on our technique for investing there, 
um, because we're seeing a, a, a very significant range of capital uh, heading in that direction. Of course, climate and climate risk is all around us. We're seeing it, I believe, um, and we need to think through the management of that, but it also presents op opportunities in portfolios. So just on the last point, uh, before I come back to Will and perhaps take questions, um, the real art in investing is the strategy. There's no question about that. And you can get views on markets, on views on central banks and views on the direction of the world. It is very, very hard to predict um, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen in the next 12 months or the next two or three years. It is certainly uh, much easier to just have a clear strategy. And today, you know, we've got a series of scenarios that I think you need to run through your portfolio. Some include the rise in potential rise in real rates. Some include, uh, for example, the lack, the, the lack of um, uh, uncorrelated assets and how you find defensive assets. Others include, I do believe that we're going to see a marginal increase in inflation and certainly the possibility of inflation. So you need to check your portfolio against inflation risk. Um, and really, that's the very best way to construct a portfolio is to have it as robust as you possibly can against a variety of scenarios. Um, I just finally say, I think some of the smartest investors that I've observed are considering being a little more cautious here. It doesn't mean that they're right. But what they're really also thinking through is a number of these big secular trend changes that are occurring around us. You know, what happens if globalization does back off? What happens if inflation uh, rallies? You know, what is the impact of technology in the portfolio? And here, active management and thinking through those characteristics inside a portfolio, I think, will be significant. I'm prepared to bet that in the next five to 10 years, major trends will change here, and we need to prepare to, to build robust portfolios that can withstand as many of those possible scenarios uh, as we can. But, you know, it has been a terrific year for investing. In fact, it's been a terrific 10 years for investing. Uh, and what it's telling me, at least, is that for the next period, uh, we just have to use a lot of skill in our investing that just the, the, the trail winds behind us may slow, and therefore the quality of the asset and the way you select your assets and your asset managers will be a more significant proportion to investment returns, not just the beta, which is really what we've enjoyed in the last 12 months. But I'll just hand back to yourself, Paul. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I disappeared. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm just going to just start with a couple of questions I've got whilst we let um, the audience sort of the, the, some of the questions there build up. Um, we do have one, but I'll just start with a couple that I've got, as I mentioned to you before. So every cycle is different. So what stood out for you as a differentiator in what we've gone through in the last 18 months? Um, and what do you think you've learnt as a result? Yeah, look, <laughs> I've learnt that I'm getting older, Will. Um, so there's new developments in the markets that we need to think through. I wasn't hopefully too far behind the developments, but uh, in the last 12 months, we're seeing the emergence of technology and change that is very, very significant. Uh, the solution to that is surround yourself with young people, talk to young people, um, and make sure that they're keeping you sharp in your thinking and that you don't get stuck in, in, in old world thinking. Um, the second thing I've learned in the last 12 months is that um, the insurance policy that's been so important for us as investors in the last 35 years actually worked again. Um, you know, the, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy bailed the system out. I remain concerned though, that we've now called on that four or five times in the last 30 years. And I think even the central banks are concerned that their ammunition and firepower for another downturn in the future isn't available. I don't wanna be bearish here at this point, but we should, we should reflect on how important, and this really did start in 1987 when central banks immediately intervened to prevent what uh, at that point they were concerned about could be a depression. But we've called on that now a number of times and we've just used a very big uh, um, um, uh, amount of that. Um, and I concern that perhaps we're becoming complacent about what true risk looks like inside our portfolios. So, you know, that's been a lesson. Um, don't fight the Fed's been a lesson, but that's been one for some time. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, make sure you stick to a medium term strategy, which hasn't been new for this cycle, but you really had to look through last year and continue to take a medium term view. And I think that's just proven once again how important that is. Look, um... As, you know, everyone knows the, the performance from equity markets and therefore, as a result, our clients have strong performance. Um, but someone asked me uh, if I'd ever known a time when it was so easy to make money. Um, so that, those sort of complacent comments really do worry me. 
Uh, where do you see us in the equity market cycle? Um, and also, you, please feel free to comment on complacency as well. Yeah, I think there's two camps, aren't there? There's the complacent ones, um, which I do find people are talking about that. I find young people uh, engage with the markets more today uh, than I've seen for a very long time. And I worry about their lack of experience at it. And now I'm saying very old, but there is a degree of complacency amongst somewhat amongst young investors. Yeah. The flip side is I do, in, in all honesty, how many people I know that say, I cannot believe how much money I've made that there's a sense of sort of shock about, say, asset prices. I was talking to somebody the other day that, you know, he's had a bid on an industrial property that he has that he simply cannot believe. And, you know, I think there's a bit of um, not worry about it. Clearly, it's nice when you're being very well bid like that. Um, but I think we probably all, in all honesty, reflect and say that our portfolios have become very somewhat extended and certainly better than we could ever have imagined. I think it's worth remembering that because, it may be at some future occasion we get giving some of that back up um, simply because things are overdone in the short term or even, even for a couple of years. Um, but I think in all honesty, you know, many of the people I talk to are perhaps less complacent but more surprised by how well things have, have gone for them in recent years. And I think we just must remember that, that a, bit, a bit's in the bank already, so don't go re-levering up um, and, and making those mistakes. That would be the real cardinal error error at this point. Uh, Steve Hiscock's got a question here. Could you please share your thoughts about China? Is the pullback an opportunity? Yeah, look, I think China's pullback is an opportunity. China, as everybody is probably well aware, and I've been to China many, many times over 30 years. I helped set up a major joint venture up there and I'm quite close to it. Now, I'm not claiming to be an expert. <laughs> Nobody's a full expert on China, but uh, what strikes me is that they have taken a clearly different path right throughout this cycle. Um, they made mistakes. They allowed shadow banking to get out of control in 2011. And I was quite close to the sort of policy environment in my role at the Future Fund there and seeing them in action and the way they thought that through. They made errors with the regulator, for example. They allowed a, a gap in the regulations to occur so that shadow banking exploded to the upside. Um, they are also trying to do some other things which are long overdue. They're trying to, for example, make bondholders wear the cost of investing in companies that are over levered. Um, this is new. This wasn't around five, 10 years ago. You could assume the government would step in and bail you out. They're trying to find techniques and mechanisms to send market signals um, without blowing up the system. They're also trying to cap out debt growth. They're trying to create a more balanced economy. They're trying to create a more internally oriented economy. And as everybody else is aware, they could have been tempted many times here to use very aggressive fiscal policy to kind of rev up the economy and get it above a stream. As part of my offer for all, I spoke at a conference at Tsinghua University in 2018. Um, I, was, I was not important at all. Uh, there were only four foreigners there. It was run by the central bank. But the most important presentation I thought was by a US academic who was asked to tell China what their medium term growth rate looked like. And he uh, came up with a very clear argument as to why at that point he thought it would settle down at about 5% per annum, that a more moderate growth rate was going to be in play. And I'm not saying that he drove Chinese policy, but there was a lot of nodding of heads. In other words, China has been preparing for a lower growth, more moderate period uh, and they're backing that up with more structure and framework. Now, recently we've seen regulatory changes and other things as cause volatility in the economy, but I do think for a diversifying asset, there is room for it in portfolios. There is yield up there. Um, it's, it's clearly got some inherent risks to it because it is an emerging country and we are coming to grips with the way policy is developed there. Um, but I do think that, um, that it has a role to play in portfolios. I'll just make one final point. There's many views on China and what its role is. I was always struck by the notion that China had studied Singapore very closely many years ago, and particularly the role of Lee Kuan Yew. And I'm not suggesting that there are direct parallels. People in Singapore would probably disagree with this. But there's been quite a few policies recently that have a feel of Singapore to it in the sense of uh, a maternalistic style policies on the cultural behavior outcomes um, I'm not saying it's going to turn into Singapore that there aren't factors that we need to consider uh, as investors, but it's interesting. They somewhat are applying a Singaporean style model and perhaps we'll get a more consistent growth rate in China 
Um, and really net net, that won't be a bad uh, um, thing to have somewhere in your portfolio as a diversifier. Good. Uh, JT has got a question here. Mark, you raised the question about what defensive looks like. Right. In the case of the future fund, it's 13% cash, 7% fixed income debt. But the rotation is clearly into PE and alternatives. So with bond rates where they are, 60, 40 may not be defensive. And with leverage and PE, maybe that is more risk than is being spoken about. So what does defensive look like? Is it cash and diversification bearing in mind your comments about manager selection? Yeah, it's a good question, JT. And um, I obviously can't speak for the future fund, but um, if you haven't seen it, you should read their recent piece. Uh, I did actually have a chat with the future fund just the other day, very senior person there. We we're talking about what they're doing. They've really put a lot of thought into what the 10 drivers could be for the next decade. And to their credit, they're sharing it. You don't have to agree with them, but they're thinking that through really carefully. And they're definitely thinking through what diversification um, looks like. Uh, my answer to it is, is that diversification can be in unlisted. Uh, they give you characteristics that you can't get in other places. And certainly it diversifies away listed uh, volatility. Um, but I, I think you're right, JT, in the sense that um, there is an enormous amount of money in VC today. In fact, probably excessive money. There is certainly appears to be excessive money and some indicators of, of too much money in private equity. And there's a very strong temptation for people to use leverage and other techniques to get juice up, get returns up. And, and that is inherently risky. But I think the real lesson from funds like the Future Fund is that diversification in itself is a very good defensive strategy. And the Future Fund, I think, has led the way in that. Uh, and in many ways, they've had the luxury to be able to do that. And I think there's a lesson there. In terms of other forms of diversification, you know, I'm here today, I'm an advisor to Jamison Coop Bonds. And, and you might wonder, you know, where do bonds sit in the portfolio? I do think that, first of all, bonds are already quite a low weight in most people's portfolios, but I do think that yielding assets perhaps don't look attractive today, but they will act as a diversifier. And so think about it this way, we've had such leverage in risk assets, in fact, we've all had such incredible returns, that you're giving up a bit in a part of the portfolio for its diversification. And so on the surface, it doesn't look overly attractive, um, uh, clear, clearly, it, but it does act as a ballast and it's one of the few forms of diversification. The other area that people are debating about here in Australia is the role of the Australian dollar. Traditionally, having offshore currency acts as a diversifier. There is some, I think, good debate about how effective that'll be in the next downturn, depending on, on the, the characteristic of it. And the reason that people are wondering a bit about that is that because our currency is no longer a high yield currency, it's not necessarily attracting cash inflows that normally then runs out in a crisis, i.e. causes the currency to be defensive. Um, and it could well be that uh, it'll be defensive, but perhaps not as powerfully so. So my answer to it is that there are shortage defensive assets, but you may have to pay up a little bit for them. And therefore things like bonds and particularly bonds that are managed to, to keep the duration under control and um, by the way, there are other managers that do this. So I don't mean to be plugging Jamison Coop bonds here, Will, but but I do think that it's that it's getting a wrap which isn't quite um, you know hasn't quite been thought through as much as it could. Yep. Um, Michael's asking, do you have a medium term view on the Aussie dollar USD sort of cross rate? So where it, where is it going? <laughs> well, the good news is that you often get that question in a retail forum, and you know someone's about to go travelling, and they'll remember the forecast precisely. Uh, in the next six weeks or something, but since no one's going travelling, presumably, um, you know, I, I think the Aussie is going to drift lower over time, personally. Um, but you know, I'm not a particularly strong currency forecaster. I use it more as an asset within the portfolio construction. Um, the funds, interestingly, institutional funds in Australia have been upping their offshore currency as a defensive asset when you look at the data, um, and so I would tend to back that as part of the portfolio. What we have over the medium term though, is a question about diversifying our exports. This has been a long-standing issue for us as Australians, um, but you know, I, do, I do worry about our lack of diversification and whether it's now five or 10 years time, um, you know, that, that, that could become a factor, certainly in foreign investors' uh, views here. So, but for the time being, I think the Australian dollar is somewhat range-bound. Range uh, certainly our, current, uh, our trade surplus is terrific for now. Um, it doesn't matter what we do, we don't seem to, we seem to be able to print trade surpluses. Um, so I wouldn't certainly be expecting the Aussie dollar to collapse any time in the short term. Uh, Damon's asking here, given banks and mining stocks still account for so much of the 
domestic market. What's your view on both those sectors from here? Will banks essentially become dividend machines again, given their strong balance sheets? And does the move in the iron ore price, for example, illustrate that our big miners have had their dream share price run? <laughs> um, they're both very good questions, Damien. I think, I think that's right. I think uh, that a dividend um, uh, um, characteristic of banking is, is, has really been in play for some period of time. Uh, it's very important that the banks themselves think about that. Uh, I've been worried, for example, that, um, uh, that when you go X growth or your, you know, your growth rate plateaus, it's very important that the management structure inside banks is incentivized to achieve other things than just growth. And I think that's finally been realised. So, for example, you know, cost and expense control, the role of technology here in the financial services industry surely must be a very significant issue that all banks around the world are considering. And that could actually give quite significant uh, boost to returns over time. I don't think Australian banks are leading the charge there, but they need to get on with it, um, which, uh, which is going to involve some serious investment and strategy. Um, but if they can get that balance right, and most importantly, control their executives to be incentivized and focused, but not necessarily shooting for growth and doing crazy things, which I don't think the current bank management are, um, that does create a, a, a very strong possibility of being very sound uh, dividend machines and a yield that we're all seeking. Uh, in relation to the resources sector, it's interesting there, I don't sense excessive bullishness. I do sense caution. It's interesting, this has been probably one of the least loved rallies in the iron ore price almost everywhere, perhaps other than the West Australian Premier, who can't believe his good luck. Um, but I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't see them doing bad capital allocation. I actually, interestingly, I think boards have learned that counter cyclical capital allocation is actually hugely value added to shareholding. Uh, and if they've got that mentality, they're also going to be pro dividend. And, and I think that's just an underlying shift that we've seen in, uh, generally speaking, across that sector. So again, that's pro. Now, I'm not saying you go out and buy the stocks tomorrow, that's not a recommendation. But the philosophy of management and the philosophy of the culture of each of the companies so often drives the medium term characteristics that you get from them. And I think their mindsets have changed. Uh, John's asking, do you think that every pullback in the economy will be shallow as governments look to use MMT to shield the populist from pain of job losses? Yeah, so MMT uh, is uh, obviously a bit of a pop area. Um, I have a little slide that I had to use the other day that, um, that looks at all the books that are currently popular around the world. Uh, and what strikes me about books is I used to visit the Singapore airport and you could see the trends of when things are completely overdone because every book's on that topic. And what's really interesting today is that books are on so many different topics, MMT, climate, the role of technology, you name it, inequality. Um, they're very significant topics and topic issues. MMT is just one of them. But it does indicate that there are many other things for the politicians to consider and not just MMT. Uh, and I think that uh, many political parties will go back to form uh, where they'll be worried about fiscal, be worried about the size of debt. Um, we know demographics are only going to get worse for debt, for pensions and, and other issues. And I think this is an untold issue. I, I think the coming back to raising taxes, coming back to ways to fix the fiscal uh, environment. We saw it in the OECD report this week for Australia that we need to do something about our fiscal environment. So this is a long learned 20 or 30 year lesson about fiscal tightening. So therefore, for now, I don't think the MMT guys have the upper hand. And of course, politics can play a really terrific part of that. And as I mentioned, in my brief discussion, you know, if the Republicans were to get both the House and the Senate or the Senate or some combination, they could very easily start going down the track of tightening fiscal as the states did under Obama. And next thing, they're talking about Biden's inability to get growth above two or three percent, and that becomes a, a real focal point for 2024. They're hugely incentivized to take that approach should they get power in 22. Um, Mandy's asking, uh, what do you think is the biggest risk to the investment outlook going forward? <laughs> uh, you've probably asked the question in, in, a, in another way, Will, which is complacency. Um, I think the biggest risk for anyone's investment portfolio is not fully understanding it. Uh, and I know that is somewhat insulting to suggest, but there is a very small proportion of people, I think, even amongst really seasoned investment professionals who know what your aggregate portfolio is likely to do. And so they know, for example, you might have a great real estate investment or a great investment in an equity manager or a great investment in another area, 
Uh, where the real art is, is that how is that whole combination going to behave on a future occasion? And, you know, things like uh, something I call hidden risks are emerging. So, for example, if you're adding lots of leverage inside private equity, your portfolio is getting more leverage. It's getting more debt inside it. And so it's the aggregate portfolio that will be important that will cause you challenges in the future and therefore not make it as robust to the environment that you would expect. Another way that can occur is that if you've had a very successful, I was seeing something this morning about uh, you know, an investor in Canberra and he was saying that his holding there is equal to all of his other investments. Well, that's absolutely great outcome, but he has got a dilemma from a portfolio point of view because he's got a massive overweight. And so if you've got the same issue where you've got your bet sizing wrong or, or your managers are all drifting because they're under enormous peer group pressure to copy each other, um, before you know it, your total portfolio has a characteristic and you only find out about it in the downturn. The flip side of that on a positive note is that uh, last year's correction, I think, did help test out some of the managers that hadn't seen corrections, even though it was very short. And so I think the private debt market is very, very crowded and you need to choose your managers very carefully. But there are some seasoned teams now who had to renegotiate some of their debts, had to build debt recovery people inside their shop. And so the one good thing about last year's shakeout, at least, is it did test some of the robustness of some of these new sectors. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, is, uh, is a net positive as well. Yep. Uh, at, at HWP, we repeatedly talk about the need to watch fi fixed income markets. Um, so where do you see inflation? Um, you know, is it, are we really talking about transitional or cyclical? Uh, so systemic, sorry. And bond markets uh, as economies normalise going forward. Yeah, the inflation I do think is, is uh, trans transitory here. But I do also think that we're building the foundations for moderately higher inflation over time. It's going to get a little sticky, basically. Uh, you know, globalization, flexibility in the global economy. Uh, I think those factors are now with us for a sustained period. Um, I also think that things like you know, the consolidation of companies, giving them pricing power and other things uh, will result in stickiness. Um, you know, the, the RBA this week again was talking about the need to get wages up. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a 70s style environment. We don't seem to get that momentum of, of wages higher. And of course, we have other overhangs like debt and other issues that won't allow, uh, you know, a real takeoff of, of interest rates. So I think we're going to see the peak. We're in the process of seeing the peak of the current rebound in CPI. We're going to go back to a moderately higher level. I think central banks do want it to be higher. They may regret that, actually, to be honest, when they have to then... Uh, take action if it gets out of control, but I don't see it getting out of control, so they're probably okay. Uh, in relation to rates, you know, I do think rates are going to gradually back up higher. This is going to give a kind of a reinsurance opportunity. I talked about the defensive role, um, you know, and I think that's how they'll become more defensive as well over time. Uh, and as I say, managers in that space can manage the duration to try and protect you during that backup. I don't see rates going up very significantly, though, but they'll go up enough to become defensive just at the time that you might need them. Okay. One area of concern for us is fixed income. Um, we see portfolios coming over to us from brokers in particular that are full hybrids um, in the de defensive fixed income you know, buckets instead of bonds and uh, or cash. And in the diversified credit area, we are seeing a lot of product where we believe there's a mismatch at the moment between risk and return. So in the chase for yield, people are forgetting about risk. Um, so just the can you expand on risk? Because we, we see risk as a, it's one of the elements we, we always are looking for when we're managing a portfolio. Yeah, you're right to look at that, Will, obviously. And um, the one thing about having specialist credit managers, uh, you know, it's a good thing because they're specialists in their field. Uh, but many of them have not seen downturns. I mentioned before, they've seen minor versions of it last year and they could test some of their systems, but many have not seen it. They're also under pressure to get invested, to stay invested. Um, and so we've seen creeping going on where we're seeing, as you said, implied equity inside the product, yep. that if push comes to shove, it will act more, much more like equity than it will uh, about yield. Um, you know, and I think looking through those portfolios and making sure they're well structured uh, is very important. The other way to do it uh, is, to, is to look behind the industries, the sectors, the way they're constructed, um, because if you're not careful, you'll essentially have exposure to real estate or exposure to some characteristic inside a yielding portfolio. Uh, we've seen covenant light debt around the world uh, rocket. Um, it's plateaued a bit more recently, but 
you know, covenant light debt, of course, is taking away those protections that you have as a, as a debt lender inside your portfolio. Uh, I don't want to frighten people off credit. It has a role to play. Uh, I would definitely do, do the most important thing is that separate your credit manager from your safe fixed income manager because they are two skills and you can keep an eye on both buckets. Um, but I think, you know, it's up to, you know, the advice of people like Will um, or, or, or your own advisor to carefully pick through the debt and, and particularly, um, you know, in the next 12, 18 months or two years, if people become more complacent. Uh, it's amazing how um, there's an old joke about property investors, but it definitely applies to credit. You know, you've got a good one every 12 years and maybe that 12 years is going to come around again at some point. And you just need to make sure that that team, that that structure, that portfolio is as robust to the possibilities in that environment. And as you said, there is quite a lot of equity like characteristics in some of these mm -hmm. portfolios. Uh, and just one last thing, Will, if it's got a really high yield in the current environment, there's every chance that it's got risk. <laughs> I mean, there is no way of doing that. And I've seen this cycle when I was in the UK of so-called yielding products being sold at eight, 10, 12%. They all blew up in somewhat scandalous circumstances. I'm not saying that's gonna happen here. We are better regulated today, but if someone pr promised you a very high yield, I'll almost guarantee you that they're taking a risk that you just need to think through very, very carefully. Given um, you know the way we're looking at markets uh, going forward and what's happened, with, and you know there are, even today there's some sectors that are you know performing well and the outlook's strong, and there's some that are really hurting. Um, but the big growth in the last twenty years has been passive. Um, my own personal view is that as we look forward, this is an environment where you know, active is is really going to come back and come. And we've already seen it in the last twelve months, actually amongst the managers we use. Um, so what's your view on this passive versus active debate? <laughs> Look, uh, passive uh, was always going to grow in share. I think that was always inevitable. It has a role to play in people's portfolios. What it has done is it's skewed the exposure of the winners keep becoming bigger winners because the passive players have to keep buying it. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing in passive is we're seeing the development of sleeves of passive. So you know, my, my, my uh, 20, mid-20s son, who's an otherwise bright guy, has his ETF in, in rocket, rockets. <laughs> um, you know, the reality is he's taking a big active bet. Uh, for some reason, I think he's thinking that's almost passive. Uh, and so passive is starting to divide itself up in all sorts of different ways. And the question is that if you're going to go and pick these themes, are you skilled at it or is somebody skilled at doing it? Um, so passive is, is, is got, has got different characteristics to it today than it had before. And in many ways, that opens the opportunities for smart active managers. It means that money is pouring into so-called passive funds, but levering up the tech sector, arguably, to overvalued levels from time to time. And so this is going to open up an alpha for good active managers that wasn't available previously. When, when active just went straight to simple passive, so the index, um, it didn't net net improve the alpha environment for active managers, but when passive managers are now producing effectively leverage vehicles or sector th themes or other things, they're going to skew the, the world in those directions, which may create overvaluation, which may therefore create an environment for truly active people, people who look at the whole portfolio and figure out what's a winner and what's a loser for them to start adding value all over again. So I'm quite optimistic for that fundamental reason um, that there is a role for active in your portfolio. Uh, Damon's asking another question here. Do you believe there's a danger of institutional investors and asset owners overreaching in their rapidly emerging activism on issues such as climate change and gender diversity? Uh, I, I don't think they're going to overreach, Damien. I think, um, you know, there's two parts to what institutions do, and the second part does not get discussed enough, really. But institutions, uh, I'll start with the second part first, institutions fundamentally want their companies to grow. They fundamentally want growth in the system and growth in the environment, uh, and they want uh, good governance for that reason. They want companies to be brave when the opportunities are there to be had. And, and there's proof in this. Institutions have been supporters of new and emerging companies, uh, perhaps not as much in the past here in Australia, but they're beginning to emerge there. Australian institutions are investing in those areas. And so they're very pro-growth and very pro Getting, getting good returns from their overall investment. That part of the conversation when institutions talk to companies doesn't really get discussed much. Uh, 
but it is an important part. And you ask any fund manager what they talk to CEO, uh, CEOs and chairs in particular about is how are you going to make your company grow? How are you going to make it a winner in whatever environment they're involved with? The secondary part, which is environmental, social governance, perhaps climate policies, that has begun to get emphasis. But, you know, I would, I would say that good governance does result in good investment outcomes. The environment cannot be ignored. And good social environment, I think, has been underestimated uh, across companies. I, I think it should hurt for boards if they have to restructure. If they're about to lose their staff, that's a big deal. They're our people. And I think a, a better way of thinking about the way you run your company and, and act as a collective, I'm not saying institutions are, are giving that argument. That's a personal argument of mine. But, but I think the whole thing about good governance, good social uh, approach to uh, running the company and good environmental really just creates better returns. But I think still the vast majority of the conversation between institutions, between fund managers, is how can you get growth? How can you be a winning company? Because that's what we really want. And we should talk about that more often because good boards are doing great work in that area. We've seen some terrific turnarounds here in Australia in, in areas like difficult retail, for example. Uh, there's been great turnarounds. I know a, a supporter of yours, Will, you know, JB Hi-Fi. That is great governance and great board behavior and great positioning of a business ready for strategy. And institutions are very appreciative of that. We just don't talk about it enough. And I think there is much more balance in the conversation than perhaps gets uh, gets talked about. You think the fund management industry, though, he was sort of late to the party uh, in many respects. It's, it's look, UNPRI is becoming very much a, a common thing now um, amongst the domestic, in the domestic fund management market. But this, you know, five or six years ago, you go overseas, especially to the UK and Europe, and you could tell this was coming, it was coming fast, and it was gonna come hard. But I, I sort of feel that in some respects, a lot of the domestic industry has been brought into it, kicking and screaming to an extent. Um, the, the, however, I will say the industry funds that have led on that. Yeah, I think in some ways they have, certainly the formal structure of ESG rating and the processes behind ESG, um, uh, they've been less inclined to get onto, although they are now, clearly. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's happened in ESG, but even in institutions, is sometimes the ESG people have been over here with the right theories and practices, while the investment people have been on over here, and the two haven't been communicating. ESG needs to be thought about as a money-making enterprise as well as a, 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 as a good social enterprise. But on the other hand, I think we're being a little harsh. I used to get asked this question at Senate Estimates about the role of, for example, exclusions versus engagement. And I used to point to many, many examples where our corporates behave much, much better today due to good engagement. You know, I know a lot of active fund managers who just will not tolerate corporations doing bad practices. And this goes back 20 odd years. So you think about some of the mistakes some of our mining companies made, and I don't want to pick on them in particular, but you know, some of the things they've done in offshore markets, which perhaps if we look back today, we'd say, thank God we don't do those sort of things today, that we do care about the communities offshore. You know, that was active managers in there saying that's not good enough. That wasn't just institutions. So I think there's been a little more ESG going on. And, and some of the, my friends who are active fund managers, um, they are so, they, they have in the past at least got so frustrated with poor governance practices. So they've really been at the forefront of encouraging good governance, good selection of board members, uh, you know, good sense of strategy, um, you know, th th they've been asking for that for many years. It may not have been packaged in a UNR P PRI or a ranking system, but they really have had an influence and, and corporates have responded. Yep. Uh, Clyde Petrini's asked, is the growth of ETFs creating a future problem for private investors? When, if a market does a downturn happen? Yeah, great. That's, a, that's a, a, an important question. People were worried about the role of ETFs, uh, in particular in a, in a sudden crisis. And as we all know, last year was, it was very unusual. As I say, I was in the US during February. And what really struck me, I visited maybe 25 very well known, and you'd know them, large institutions, very the smartest thinkers probably. And no one in the US was talking about COVID. Uh, amazingly, one, one uh, private equity firm said, don't shake hands. And it really stood out because no one else seemed to be discussing. It. And this was right up towards the end of February. And then bang, all of a sudden they realized that was the case. And, and we saw very, very aggressive move in markets. It was a very good road test for the role of ETFs. Can these giant funds manage an ETF during a dislocation? And it doesn't appear that there were any uh, uh, problems or roadblocks um, in their trading. They didn't have to shut systems down. Now we did see 
Some funds uh, uh, spreads widen in, in some areas, but generally liquidity was okay. Of course, the surprise to all of us is that the US Treasury market had troubles. And you know, there's been a lot of thinking about that. What are the implications of that? And I think there's a broader um, you know, response here that we should all think about, which is you know, liquidity is not guaranteed. And I think in the back end, and you maybe you look at this every five years, is my portfolio as liquid as I'd like? Uh, what's my illiquidity budget? These are things institutions actually think a lot about. Um, you know, and I think uh, that's a warning. I was put onto this in the early 2000s when I just happened to have dinner through a contact with Neil Ferguson, the famous um, historian. And he told the story, which many of you may know, is that the UK stock market shut for six months when the First World War was declared. It certainly got me thinking about the assumption of liquidity. And one characteristic of all bull markets is that everybody assumes liquidity is available. So it might be in ETFs and, and certainly, you know, the, the, black, the, the black rocks of the world are now absolutely giant funds. They are systemic, possible systemic risks. So they do have to be careful. But there are other parts of our portfolios, particularly as institutions, more outside of Australia are increasing their un, unlisted and illiquids. They have to go in with their eyes wide open and make sure they've got a really clear risk strategy for illiquidity. But we all need to do that. Do not assume Ill, uh, liquidity is always available. You touched on uh, demographics before and uh, you know, the areas of the world where you saw, the, the countries where you saw growth. Um, and we also were talking about China, but one of the things about China is that I, there's a demographic issue in China as well. So yeah. it's not just the fact that it's, you know, and they're saying that the fact that demand is now, it's domestic demand, which is the positive, but you're also seeing population contracting. So. You know, these are issues that, you know, it's the large, second largest economy in the world to be the largest. Um, you know, can you just sort of talk about that a little bit? Because that's the opposite effect. Yeah, this has got China's attention. Uh, you'll know that from the changes in policy to the one child. But I think, you know, this recent policy around, uh, for example, tutoring companies, which you're probably familiar with, um, is a bit about that. The policy around property is a little bit about that. Um, they would like uh, families to have more kids but there are quite a few barriers. Um, if you have more children, but you're only in a two bedroom flat and flats are already, or apartments are already very, very expensive. Uh, it's not a simple exercise of just adding more kids. We get the luxury perhaps more here in Australia. Um, so they've got some barriers, but as long as 10 years ago in 2011, I attended some uh, sort of policy conferences up there. They're talking about, for example, their, their pension system, their retirement system and support around that because they wanted more domestic consumption yet people are saving. They have imbalances through saving, which he's trying to deal with, which is there is there is a shortage of places to get diversified returns. And of course, money has rushed towards property as one of the primary solutions. Um, these are all issues that they're gonna to have to deal with through retirement. They've got plenty of scope though for per capita GDP growth still because their per capita GDP is low. And so their net growth rate can still remain positive, but there's absolutely no question that they're now pushing into a headwind. I thought it was interesting that it was widely reported that last year the population in China declined. Uh, next minute, China came out with some numbers which showed it marginally increased. That indicated to me that China was sensitive to this topic and they're very sensitive to uh, the role of contraction. But they're working on a series of policies to try and get through this. But I think we should net net just recognize that growth will be more moderate and, and this needs to be watched. What they need to be careful of on a 10 year view though is that uh, property in some of these other areas if people say start to liquidate at the margin to use for pensions or other things um, there's a market there that's very expensive that could come under pressure and this is one of the aspects of demographics we've never put a sophisticated financial system through absolute declines in population and an absolute decline in population i probably said this to your audience before well uh, the example i use if you have 10 houses in the street uh, and the population is growing there's always someone to buy the next house and we've seen that here in australia but if you have 10 houses in the street and there's no population growth, in fact, it declines and the 10th person declines, there's now a vacant house. It affects the value on all other nine. Uh, and we see this in rural parts of Japan. Uh, there's something in the Wall Street Journal today about Latvia that's suffering from this. It does start to muck around with asset values over a long-term timeframe. So, you know, we just need to be mindful of how to navigate through this. And certainly we need to hopefully encourage those demographic winners, the Indias, as I mentioned, uh, Indonesia's, Philippines, but also the Africa's and other places, if we need to get global growth, they need to hopefully be part of that uh, marginal global growth push. 
Okay. Uh, Damon's asked one more question. Uh, does the amazing Canva private capital raising this week mean we'll see more of these companies stay private given they're able to access significant funding in private markets? And what does this mean for the ASX? Well, Damien, as you know, uh, the ASX thinks a lot about this and, and we've seen a curious year, haven't we? Because we've seen SPACs develop uh, as, a, as an exit mechanism and by their very definition, SPACs are listed. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's been a lot of talk about the end of the listed company and yet we've seen a surge of SPACs as one of the solutions and many private equity firms have taken advantage of that to create liquidity in their portfolios. So it's not been all one-way uh, traffic. Uh, you write about Canva and others using the private markets, and we're going to see some incredible technology here, which is already becoming into play, which is trading of private assets off market, uh, finding ways to get liquidity. We've seen a very significant uptick in secondary, secondary sales in private equity in the last 12 or 18 months, which shows, again, liquidity in otherwise illiquid places. Um, but I still think the listed markets have a role to play, um, a very important role to play, because uh, the call on capital is significant. We saw this in 08, where, as you know, uh, as the audience would know, about 100 billion was raised in, in equity through the listed markets. Fortunately, last year, mainly due to government policy and, and particularly fiscal policy, um, there was no need to raise the same amounts. But, you know, perhaps we'll see again in some future occasion that people will realise that there is value in liquidity. Um, the offset to that is that some of the tech players are seeing some tech stocks here wane. Uh, you know, Uber has not, it's picked up more recently, but there's been a few that listed that didn't do so well. Um, well, Uber, not so much. But even things like Tesla have stalled here. Zoom is starting to talk, stall. The public markets tend to tell the truth about what's going on. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure some of the private equity and uh, private asset owners won't want to get that, that disclosure too, too early, particularly if they're able to sell at these valuations. But ultimately, uh, get, getting capital raising during all the cycles that could come up in the future means that there is a role for listed equity. Good, look, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious of time and we're nearing five o'clock. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there. So Mark, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Incredibly insightful. Um, and thank you to the audience. I uh, very much appreciate you attending as well. Um, so at that, I'll leave it there and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much.